So thank you very much for having me here. Um, I wrote in the, uh, the introduction that Lauren asked me to, to produce to kind of um, give a bit of an idea about what I wanted to talk about. Some questions along the lines of why do we get ill? Why do we die? Why are there earthquakes, floods and pandemics? And then um, I wanted to talk about those from a, from a biblical point of view and link that to, uh, to Satan and what I call the forces of chaos. Um, I was, as I was writing that um, introduction, I was reminded of what I learned when I was studying for the ministry as the answer to why do we get ill. And the answer that I was given was that so that we can witness to people who are in the bed next to us in hospital, um, which I found a slightly um, unrewarding uh, answer, let's put it that way. Um, there are... And I think the, the more traditional answer that we get, which I'm going to look at first, is that it's some way related to, to sin, that um, a lot of these bad things in the world relate to sin. And um, we're going to spend some time thinking about that, talk, talking about that, um, and looking at what the Bible says about Satan that we may not have noticed before because we... we, we looked we overlooked some of the the details maybe or maybe this is something that you've all heard before and then uh you can uh you can have ask some interesting questions at the end so um when we talk about um those questions like wh why do we get ill why are there earthquakes why are there floods why are there pandemics why are there why is there a war in ukraine right now um uh the way that uh that adventism often answers it relates to the great controversy um and we, we link it to things like sin or Satan, or the fall. And um, a good way to start, and I'm just going to read us our, our, um, the fundamental that was voted um, on the Great Controversy. This is the latest one from 2015. Um, it's a paragraph, and uh, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the bold text in the middle. So when we get to that one, pay good attention. All humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his so sovereignty over the universe. This conflict originated in heaven when a created being, endowed with freedom of choice, in self-exaltation became Satan, God's adversary, and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disordering of the creative world, and its eventual devastation at the time of the global flood, as presented in the historical account of Genesis 1 through 11. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universal conflict, out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in this, in his, this controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit, and the loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. Now, um, as someone who um, does biblical studies academically, I can point out many, many things that I think are wrong with the statement for, for various reasons from the simple, like I don't think it's Christ who sends the Holy Spirit, that God that sends the Holy Spirit, um, to what I think is just a fundamental uh, issue in the statement that and that's the one i want to look at in the uh in the bold text and in the bold text there's this idea that human sin created a disorder in the created world so in other words what the statement is saying is that god created a creation that was completely ordered and then adam and eve were led astray they sinned and this created disorder in the created world and um as I'm going to be talking about today, I think this is this is just not not what the Bible teaches, and I think it's something that needs to be examined in in a bit more detail with a bit more care. The reason we say that it's a dis, that the sin created disordering of the created world, um, we find in in Genesis three, where after Adam and Eve have been led astray and they're hiding in the garden, and God finds them, then God. Um, God, God says what the consequences are of their, of their actions. And I've got it here for us. This is uh, Genesis 3. Um, God first speaks to the snake. We're not so interested in what God says to the snake there. And then um, God says to the woman, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So here, basically, what this is saying is that 
procreating is not going to be very pleasant uh, for for uh, female people. And then the second half, or the, the third half, the second half for the, for the humans is that God says to the man, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it where you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And it's specifically the second part that we often read as some kind of disordering of creation. Um, the thorns and the thistles are a, are, are a good example that kind of lives on in like Adventist Apocrypha that um, roses before the fall didn't have any thorns on them, but thanks to the fall, now roses do, do, have, uh, do have the thorns on them. Um, but I wonder if that's actually what's going on here. It seems to me that all God is saying here is that to, he's choosing two gendered options. To the woman, he's saying, well, the thing that women are known for, specifically Eve in this case, as the mother of all humankind, um, childbearing will be difficult. And then God's saying the thing that men are known for, working in fields, that's going to be difficult, difficult for them. Um, this reading into it that there's a, a disordering that causes sickness, pains, accidents, um, I don't think that's there. I don't see any real evidence for disordering of the creative world. There's just, a, 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 I suppose we could call it a curse, a curse of humankind's work that the work's going to be, be much harder. And this disordering, if we read very carefully, was actually there before. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Because the world has always had and always has a little bit of chaos in it. It is not completely, completely ordered. So we'll go a few pages back. We were in Genesis 3, but let's go back to the, uh, to the very, very beginning. In the beginning, this is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God or the Spirit of God swept over the face of the waters. Now, I don't want to get into a conversation here about how many years ago this was and we also don't want to get into conversation if that spirit is a wind or or the holy spirit or, or something else um what is important here is that god's the creation in genesis 1 1 doesn't happen from nothing but that there's something before god starts creating in the beginning when god created the heavens and the earth the earth was a formless void with darkness covering the face of the deep and the deep here is obviously the the sea the, the deep is a term for, for the sea, the waters, which is also the last verse, word of verse two. So before creation, we have this great sea from which God creates order. And if we put this into the terms that I'd like to use today, before God started creating order, there must have been something that wasn't order, which we would call, call chaos. Before creation, by its very definition, there was chaos. And from this chaos, it's a Greek word meaning disorder, God created cosmos, which is the Greek word for the, inha word for the inhabited world. From the chaos was created the, the cosmos. And amongst all of this chaos, God creates the cosmos, the inhabited world. And it talks about it, how it does. I'm going to skip a couple of days till we get to verse nine, when God says, let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. What is God doing here? Well, the sea that was there before the deep hasn't been, it hasn't disappeared. It's still there, but God's pushing it aside. Before this, he split it between the heavens and the earth, and now God's pushing it aside, and in the middle of the sea is creating this land, this, this earth, this, uh, what is it, Eretz probably there. And this, this land, this earth, is right there, a little bit an island of order in the midst of what was there before, the primordial chaos before, before creation. And then if we move a little bit further and we start to look at, well, what did God put in the sea, we get... Um, and I'm always very afraid to say, and this is day five, because sometimes I'm very bad at counting, but I think it's day five um, when God created the, the seas. Anyway, this day, 
um, God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. And what is particularly striking about this verse that um, I don't know if we spend a lot of time thinking about it is that, and so God created the great sea monsters. And these, my friends, are not whales. They're also not dinosaurs. They're not the Loch Ness monster that is just a little bit north of me. These are quite literally in the Bible, great dragons. That's the term that's used. Gedolim, what's ha gedolim ha tanim, the great the great dragons, um, sometimes translated as, as serpents. And um, these, these things, we have words for whales. It's not the big fish that eats Jonah that we have in the Jonah thing. This is a, this is a it's literally called the great dragons and we run into them a couple of times. Um, great dragons that seem to live, live in the sea. Now I know from like a physics, like a physics point of view or biology point of view, we can try to think, okay, well, what were these creatures literally? But from a theological point of view, these creatures pop up time and time again as a symbol for, for something. And this is very, very important. Um, Cause they're all over the old Testament. If you know what to look for, I'll give you a, give you a couple of examples. Psalm 74 is one of the places where we run into it. Um, the psalmist there says, it's a long psalm about the power of God. You, God, divided the sea by your might. This is clearly a reference to, to the creation thing. And you broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave Leviathan as food for the creatures of the wilderness. And so here it's talking about this dragon in the water that is called, called Leviathan. Now we know very well from, from, from cultures around the Israelites exactly what is being referred to here, but the Bible gives it a different spin to what we'd usually run into. A common one that we'd run into is something that we, that we would see in say the Baal epic. Baal epic is Canaanite myth, kind of the foundation of the entire Canaanite religion. Um, and in, in, in this myth, it talks about the storm god Baal who displaces El as the chief god in the, in the Canaanite pantheon. And to do that, Baal kind of has to do like, I don't know, 12 tasks of Hercules kind of thing and has to prove that he's worthy. And one of the things he does is defeat the great sea god called, Lava, called Yam, which means sea in Hebrew, or Lotan, which is the same word as Leviathan. It just looks very weird because Hebrew and Canaanite do different things with vowels. And this is a common thing throughout the Mediterranean cultures. We see them um, all around that you have these creation myths where you have this great sea monster that gets destroyed by the big God, and that is the creation of the world. But the Old Testament doesn't tell that story because it tells a slightly, a slightly different story. Um, in all the myths of the time, the Leviathan, or if it's called Tiamat, it's called Tiamat, is no longer around. But in the Old Testament, that creature still exists, and it's still, it's still swimming in the sea. Even though here it says you broke the, the, the heads of the dragons, if we go elsewhere, um, for example, Isaiah, um, Isaiah 27, we have a, a prophecy about, um, about some kind of um, event in the future um, where it says, on that day, the Lord with his cruel and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing snake, Leviathan the twisting snake, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. And this is the more common thing that we'll run into the, in the Old Testament, where Leviathan is still actually something that is seen to be in the sea. It's not something that has been destroyed, but something that still, still exists. And once you know what to look for, you'll see it everywhere. Ezekiel 29 says the king of Egypt is just like Leviathan. Job has a couple of chapters on it, and then also on Behemoth, which is the land version of Leviathan. Um, Psalm 104 has that thing about, oh, and the ships are the playthings of, of Leviathan. Um, we also have uh, other names for Leviathan, um, Rahab. We often run into Rahab in the Bible with a capital letter, and we don't really know what that means, maybe. Well, Rahab is another name for this ancient, ancient monster. Later, it also became a synonym for Egypt, because Egypt is monstrous, just like the monster. 
but Rahab or Rahab is um, another name of this sea monster that lives in lives in the sea. And um, just to go a little bit back to Isaiah, I've got for you at the bottom how Isaiah was translated into Greek. So Isaiah, you know, was written in Hebrew a long time ago. When they translated into Greek, they had to translate the word Leviathan, and they chose the word dragon. So at the bottom in the bold, on that day, God will bring his holy and great and strong dagger against the dragon. So Leviathan is translated as the dragon, a fleeing snake against the dragon, once again, Leviathan translated as a dragon, a crooked snake, and he will kill the dragon um, in the sea is apparently missing there. And um, it's important to just think about that the term is dragon, we'll get back to that, that in a second. So remember, God created these great sea monsters on day five. They weren't in the sea before God create, started creating, but as we read Genesis 1, it says God literally created these sea monsters on, on the fifth day. And this means that the, the Israelite culture, the Israelite religion, fits into what's going on around them, but has a different take on it slightly. Whereas the other ones see this monster as something that comes before the great creation by the great God, in the Israelite religion, you often see that this monster still exists and is still in the sea. And the sea then is seen as this huge place of, of chaos. The earth, which is seen as kind of like an island surrounded by the sea, is surrounded by this, this scary, scary um, chaos. And the snake, coiled as it is, is coiled around it. Um, and this also explains why the Israelites were so afraid of the sea. It's, it's, it's a common thing that I ask, I ask my students how many Israelites were sailors. And it's a bit of a trick question because the answer to that is zero. Um, if you read the whole Old Testament, which is quite a few words, quite a few pages, and you try to think of who's been on the sea, well, we've got, we've got Noah who predates the Israelites, um, didn't sail by choice, um, was happy that God saved him. When, uh, when Moses needs to get across the sea, he doesn't sail, but pushes the sea aside so he can cross it. And of course, that happens again when they enter the Holy Land. And then the next person to sail is, is, is our friend Jonah, who goes onto a boat that's manned by people who are not Israelites. It's very clear from the text because they ask him to pray to his God, not to our God or your God or, or, or the God, but pray to your God, Jonah. And then the next Israelite we run into sailing is, is Jesus. Um, and it doesn't work out super great for Jesus either, because what well, in the end it does, but you get you get the storm on the sea. Um, and, and it's very important to think about that, because as Jesus is sailing, um, he calms the sea. And then what do the disciples say? They look at Jesus, they look at the sea, they think it's calm now. And they say, what sort of man is this that the winds and the waves listen to him? Now, why are they so shocked about that? Specifically because the sea is seen as the superhuman primordial power that goes beyond um, human reckoning and and stands outside of the powers of, of of order out of the power outside of the powers of of God's creation so this was a very long introduction and I haven't used the word Satan yet once so probably at this time you're thinking well this is all great Tom but when are you going to talk about Satan now now we're moving on to Satan and and to do that we're gonna we're gonna jump all the way to the end, we're going to jump to Revelation. It's where Adventists feel at home. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at, at Revelation. I'm just going to remind you some things about Revelation, and then I'll put a text up on top of the sea in a second. We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 12. And Revelation chapter 12 stands out from the rest of the book of Revelation. Um, it's not introduced as a vision of God, of John, but it's, he sees an extraordinary sign in the heavens. And there's a woman giving birth. And then he sees another sign. He sees a great red dragon. And the dragon sweeps a third of the, of the stars out of the sky with its tail and then tries to devour the child. God intervenes, saves the child, brings the child up to heaven. And the woman flees into the wilderness and then um, like kind of rests for a little while. And that passage shows um, the enmity between the child and the dragon. And, and we read the child then as, as Jesus Christ and the dragon to be, to be Satan. 
and the child rules the nations and he's also called the lamb so it's, it's quite clearly clearly jesus christ um and then after that story which is still ongoing because the woman's in the wilderness fleeing and we're wondering what's going to happen is the dragon going to get her suddenly the story changes and you get a completely a complete a complete jump and we jump suddenly to something that seems maybe not related and says quite simply and war broke out in heaven um, and war broke out in heaven that michael and his angels fought with the dragon the dragon fought also his angels he did not prevail neither was a place found for him any more in heaven and was thrown down the great dragon the ancient snake the one called slanderer and satan the deceiver of the entire inhabited world was thrown down to the ground and his angels were thrown down with him well, this is probably not the translation you used to because i translated it very literally because there's some things going on here that get lost in the translations um but we have this new scene that has got nothing to do with the woman. The woman's still in the wilderness, but we've got this, this war in, in heaven. Um, Michael and his angels, they seem to fight. They seem to defeat the dragon and his forces, and the dragon is ejected, ejected from heaven. Um, the, the Christ child rules in heaven, but there is no longer a place, a place for the dragon there, which seems to say wherever Jesus is really in control, um, the adversary has no, has no place there anymore. And the victory, unfortunately, is only applied to the heavenly realm. So Satan is disempowered from the heavenly realm, but then has free reign over, over the earth. And having said all I said about the Old Testament and about the great dragons that are in day five and the Leviathan that we run into, it is a very good question to ask when the audience of John's revelation got their letter, when the seven churches unrolled the scroll and read this, and they said, and they read the thing about the great dragon, which great dragon did they came to mind? What were they thinking about? When they read the ancient snake, which ancient snake were they thinking about at that time? Now, it is very common for us to immediately jump to the snake from Genesis 2 and 3, the one in the tree, with the, the delicious apple. But that one's never called a dragon. That one's called a snake. Um, and there's, of course, a more ancient snake, the one that lives in the sea. And I'm not saying it's one or the other, but I think if we say it is one or the other, then we're leaving out a very important option, and that is that it is probably referring to both, which is why it's called a dragon and a snake. It seems to me that what... Um, John is trying to refer to here is that John is trying to invoke both of these these aspects that he's trying to remind us that there's more going on in this world than just human sin and he's trying to remind us of this other aspect this aspect of chaos so how does that look well let's talk about satan then in a bit more a bit more detail um I think I think most of most of the people who have read the Bible realize that Satan kind of comes into his own the further you get into the Bible. There's not a whole lot of Satan in Exodus or Leviticus. There's not a whole lot of Satan in, in many of the Old Testament prophets. But once you get to like the Gospels or once you get to Revelation, Satan really, really, really is there. And we we notice from a historical point of view that there is a development of of Satan in in religious thinking, in, in Jewish religious thinking and Christian religious thinking. That surely John the Revelator had a better understanding of the nature of, of Satan than Isaiah did, or at least John the Revelator tells us more about Satan than, than Isaiah does in, in any way. And um, in scholarship, we talk about the development of, the, of Satan or the development of the figure of Satan. And here's a very, just a very good quote from one of the more recent books on, on Satan. Um, the Satan tradition is one whose origins have been obscured by its evolution. The Satan has not always been what he eventually came to be. And the point that is being made here is that in the, the Old Testament, in the earlier texts of the Old Testament, the figure of Satan is not as developed as Satan is in, in Revelation or the Gospel of John. And I don't think that's that's a that's a hugely surprising 
thing to hear um because you know you don't you don't you know it's four or five times in the old testament if you're very good at reading um and it's four or five times in the first page of of matthew so you know it's, it's quite a lot more um so we talk about this development and when we look at the development of satan as the figure of satan the understanding of satan grows through time we see basically that satan's develops in three ways um and the most obvious one we can see with two old testament texts if we put them next to each other uh the first one's from second samuel the second one's from first chronicles and as, as you hopefully know samuel and chronicles tell the same stories but they're written at a different time in in history if we read the story from second samuel it says and the anger of the lord was kindled against israel and he incited David against them, saying, go and count the people of Israel and Judah. David then does a census. A whole lot of people die from a mysterious plague. It's, it's, it's bad news. When we read Chronicles, which was written quite a bit later in time, these people write the story slightly differently. It's the same story. It has the same consequences, but they don't say the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, but they say Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel. Now, what is going on here, it seems like people are starting to understand that there is more to this world than just God is responsible for all the good and all the bad. And Israelites um, are starting to realize or starting to say that some parts of this world are caused by Satan and some costs are caused by, caused by God. And we would then say something along the lines of Satan's take certain tasks over from God, whereas God was before responsible for sickness and health, for life and death. Satan becomes responsible for the sickness and the death, and God becomes responsible for the life and, and the health. Um, when people are, 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 are get a terrible plague, it's not God who's to blame, but it's Satan who's to blame. And that's, that's basically... Um, hasn't changed much with how, how most Christians nowadays view the world as well. So the development of Satan is that from this nobody, he became someone who became quite important because he took over some very important tasks from God, including tempting people, making people ill, those kind of, kind of things. The next thing, and this one people don't think about as often as this one, is, is a good example of this. This is from 1 Kings 22 um spirits are discussing like um they they're having a conversation and then one said one thing and another said another so they're having a bit of an argument until a spirit came forward and stood before the lord god and said i will entice him and this is it doesn't matter who this is some prophet and the lord said how and the spirit replied i will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets then the lord said you are to entice him and you shall see succeed go out and do it now, this doesn't fit in the view that most people have of, of God, that God would send an, a spirit, a lying spirit. So this is, this is an evil spirit to go and put false words in the mouths of the prophets and entice them. Um, this sounds more like something that a, that, a, that a demon would do, an evil spirit would do. And this is not the only place we've got the same with the spirit that causes Saul to, to act very, very poorly. And he needs David to calm him down, who seems to have exactly the same um, symptoms as the demoniacs have in have in the new testament um in the old testament then we have this thing that god commands spirits that some of them are good and some of them are bad you know you've got the spirit that comes over over samson and gives him great strength okay that's probably a good one but the spirit is is probably not not that great and god commands all of these and satan satan's all alone right satan never has a demon or a spirit assisting him in any way he doesn't have any angels in in the old testament but when we get to the new testament suddenly there's all these demons when you get to the new testament suddenly we've got and satan and his angels you know and we say the third of the stars is a third of the third of the angels so satan's got quite a big big force and this is then the second development that we see in satan that satan moves from being a one-man show to becoming a, a chief of the fallen the fallen angels and then the third one that we see and this is the one that we we particular that i'm particularly interested in today is that satan comes to be seen as the leader of of chaos and this is a little bit of a strange one because satan 
as a created being is part of creation, but he seems to kind of want to step outside of it and take charge of things that were outside of creation. Satan starts to stand for this primordial evil that predates creation. But it's, it's a slightly, but it's not entirely what's going on because Satan didn't create chaos or isn't the leader of chaos. He's more kind of the symbol for the forces of chaos. There's these forces of chaos that have always been in creation and um, he's, he's in charge, charge of them. He's seen as the, the figure of it. And how does this look? Well, if we, if we run through the Bible, and I can't do this in great detail, chaos comes back all the time. You know, before creation, the world was void, formless, covered in a sea, a film of chaos. God takes six, six days, maybe seven days, if we want to be entirely correct, to create an ordered creation. But the chaos is still, still around. The chaos comes back when we get a huge flood that destroys everything. After the flood, we get the Tower of Babel, and God then again uses chaos to counteract humankind's hubris, you know, that we will be one. And God says, no, you won't. I will disorder you. I will split you out. Um, and then Isaiah 34, 11, um, I didn't really have time to read the verse, but it's a very interesting verse. It says there that God is the constructor of chaos, that God creates chaos in this world. But then as we get further on in the, new, in the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, this idea of Satan evolves and suddenly God is not associated with chaos anymore. Um, Paul, right? And that's the famous one that the, the secretaries of the church always quote. Paul says that God is a God of order, not a God of chaos, um, which is why we need a church manual and working policies because everything needs to be ordered. Um, that's 1 Corinthians 14, by the way. Um, and, and we see when we get into the New Testament that this whole thing of chaos is pushed away from God and pushed, pushed into, into Satan's, Satan's um, uh, ballpark. Uh, field uh, and um then when we get to revelation which is which is the last book that was written in the new testament we we see that these three tasks the, these these things have have cemented in the idea of satan there's no longer any doubt right it's clear that satan has tasks he tempts people he's he, he deceives the whole world he does a whole lot of things in revelation he's clearly a chief of fallen angels and he is clearly here also um not only with the reference to uh, to the dragon, um, we can also look at the chapters thirteen and fourteen to see that where he's, where we have the the two beasts and one of them they both the beasts from Job, the chaos beast from Job, um, but he then becomes this this leader of chaos, responsible for it, and that means that Revelation, when it's telling its gospel of a great controversy where God does away with all the bad things in the world, it's not enough just to destroy the figure of Satan, God also needs to destroy the concept of chaos, this chaotic evil that is there as well. And, and we actually do see that if we read, read very carefully. Um, I've got four verses from, from, well, four sections from Revelation to look at, um, and they all concern the sea. 25 times in Revelation, we run into the word sea, and I'm reading four of them. Around the throne, this is Revelation 4, the throne room scene, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders, dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Now, the imagery of a sea of glass like crystal, and I've tried to give it here with this, with this image, as opposed to the early images I had of the sea, is that a sea of glass, one of crystal that's perfectly clear and still, is a very different sea to the chaotic sea that the Israelites are so afraid of. It's not this powerful sea where you worry that you're gonna die, it's a disempowered sea. It's, it's a sea of peace. Um, the sea has, has has, is no longer this wild thing that is out of control, but a very safe and ordered place. And this is the first time that we run into the sea um, properly like this in Revelation. A little bit further on we get, and then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass. So the sea of glass is back, but now it's mixed with fire. And those who had conquered the beast and its number, um, et cetera, et cetera, were standing besides the sea of glass. So now the sea is not only 
um, disempowered, but it's also on fire, which may seem like, oh, it's extra scary, but that's not what's going on with Revelation. Whenever we went into fire Revelation, we know it's about destruction. It's, a, it's prefiguring its destruction. The sea, we being told here in Revelation 15, that the sea is also one of the things that are going to be destroyed. And then we see another hint of that just a little bit later in Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it and the earth and the heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Also, another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and all were judged according to what they had done. So here we start to see, well, the sea is losing its power. The sea that kept all of these people dead doesn't have it. And then when we get the final, the final promise of revelation in the next chapter, chapter 21, we see, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among the mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will also be no more, for the first things that were created have passed away. So when God creates again, the second creation that is promised in Revelation, God creates a new heaven and a new earth, same as the first time, but this time the sea isn't there. And that's a major difference from the first time when the sea was there, but it was pushed aside. It was split and separated and earth was, was erected in the middle of this chaotic sea. But when God creates again, God creates without sea. So what is the meaning of that? Well, it seems like what, what, what John is trying to get across here is that this new creation is also a creation without these powers of chaos. And that also helps explain why it's not only that death won't be any, there anymore, and death is obviously the consequence of not having access to the tree, but also that mourning, crying, and pain will be no more. Um, because the forces of chaos, the stubbing your toe on the edge of your bed, which hurts like anything, um, is not necessarily the consequence of sin, but is more seen to be the consequences of, of bad luck. Um, and the good theological question to ask is, could Adam ever bump his toe and would it have hurt? Um, that's maybe something we can discuss in the, in, in, in the, 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 the comments at the end. Um, but it seems to me what, what the Bible is saying is, yes, it would have hurt for Adam because that still was there. He just wouldn't, it wouldn't have got infected and he wouldn't have died from it because he had access, access to the tree. And um, so this is, and I'll do a bit of a conclusion, and then we can have our conversation. Um, this is what I, what I, what, why I think the fundamental is not entirely correct here. My answer to why do we get ill? Why are there earthquakes, floods, pandemics, wars? Well, these are the effects of this chaos that are still part of the world. And, and we often confuse the two. And it's even, it's still, it's very difficult to think about, but if you think about it carefully, um, uh, it does kind of make sense. Um, we die because of sin. We stub our toes because of chaos. Um, when we get sick and die, which is a part of human life, in general, the cause of that is sinfulness. Right? The fact that at some stage in my life, if the Lord doesn't come before I die, I will unfortunately pass away is because of sin. That's clearly the case. But my individual sickness, if I get cancer next year and I cry out to the Lord, why me? The answer to that is not because of Tom's sin. The answer to that is just basically, well, bad luck, Tom. Um, unless you want to say it's the health message, but I don't think that's, that's fair either. Um, it, the answer to the why me call, why am I getting sick? Why did my child get sick? Why did I get in an accident? The answer to those questions are not, well, because you sinned, Tom. The answer to those questions is because it was bad luck. It was this, this chaos. It's just human. It just, that's what life on earth is. Bad things happen sometimes. And God did not push me down the stairs that I broke my ankle. And Satan didn't push me down the stairs to break my ankle. 
I was carrying too many things. I wasn't worth looking where I went and I stumbled and fell and it's, it's, it's bad luck. So the difference between sin and chaos here is that in general, when we're talking about bad things, yes, those are caused by sin because that's the nature of this world. But when we're talking about the individual parts of it, that is part of this, this chaos. And it's very important to realize for us that this chaos affects us all. And often we blame God for it. You know, as a pastor, as a pastor for eight years, the amount of times I've heard members ask me, well, you know, why me? Why did God do this to me? Why did God choose me? And the answer to that, as far as I'm concerned, is always, no, it's not. It's bad, it's bad luck. It's randomness. It's not God's plan. Um, but that these acts are random doesn't need to lead to hopeless, right? We can see that, that one, on the one hand, God promises a new creation where there is no sea, where there aren't these, these bad luck things. But we also see that God controls the sea in many places. The Israelites arrive at the sea and it parts. So God is able to push aside these forces. But the natural state of this world is unfortunately one where these things, things happen. But then ultimately, we've got the great promise of, of Revelation 21, where the new creation is fundamentally different from the old one. It is without chaos, without the sea. Um, and that's a much more... Um, pleasing answer than just one that's without sin because even without sin we'd still have unfortunate things happen but god's promise is we don't have the sin and we don't have the the other part part of it it either so that was satan and the forces of chaos in uh, in about 45 minutes i think that was round about to time um i'd love to hear what you all think about this i see some things in the chat but i obviously couldn't read